Well, hello there. Do we have some stories for you? I'm in the RFS. I've been in the RFS for 25 years. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> and they're going to kick us out. And um, I'm a deputy captain. I come down with my captain. And uh, yeah, they're going to kick us out, mate. And, uh, and I think that's, that's, you know, worth standing up for. And, you know, I don't put my life on the line for 25 years to be thrown out because I won't, you know, you know, take an injection that I'm, I'm, I don't think I, I should have to have. Three of our last six videos have been removed by YouTube, where we are permanently shadow banned, as we are on Instagram and Facebook. 90% of our audience is still on these big tech platforms, so please consider pausing this video and subscribing to our website. For independent media, head to artistersfamily.is and click on the subscribe tab. The stories you're about to hear from our hometown in Jarrah country propelled us to join tens of thousands of protesters in Canberra last weekend in Ngunnawal and Nyambri people's countries, where we also recorded stories of loss, of injury, of discrimination and of love. Before coming to Canberra, we wrote to a Nyambri elder, a friend of a friend of ours. Many in our community are suffering because of the lockdowns, mandates and vaccine injuries, we are tired of the division and segregation and know it doesn't compare to Aboriginal discrimination and segregation over generations and have Aboriginal friends around the country who are hurting because of what's going on today. We seek your acceptance to come on country to stand with other mob for a short time and we ask if you request anything from us should you think our intentions for coming are valid. We received warmth, acceptance and encouragement which set our course for a jam-packed weekend of story recording. But first, let's begin with people from our home, the voices of whom we took with us to Canberra. We just had, we just had a baby, our third baby. Yeah. And uh, housing sec you know, security is quite important for us as a family. So we started looking and um, uh, we found, there was a lady that I did gardening work for and um, she had a house nearby and it was empty. And um, I contacted her about it and I said, uh, you know, hey, um, we're looking for a house, uh, you know, at least a year, uh, possibly longer if, if that's an option. Um, how about your place? And she said, oh, I'm actually in town. She lives interstate. I'm actually in town. Would you like to come over and, um, and talk about it? So we went over and we talked about it and um, kind of uh, discussed the ins and outs of, of whether we could live in there or not. And um, after uh, a couple hours talking, we decided, yeah, okay, that's, this is it. So we were due to uh, move in the following Tuesday. Um, but as I said, I actually worked for this lady um, doing gardening work and uh, I was due to work for her the next day. <laughs> so, um, I rock up the next day with my tools and did a full day's gardening work, you know. At the end of the shift, um, we're just working out how much she owed me and um, I was packing up my tools. And she said, oh, um, have you had your boost to get? And I said, oh. And I was thinking, oh, no, she's brought it up because I hadn't had it. And I said, no, have you? And she said, of course I have, of course. She said, when did you have your last shot? <laughs> and I said, well, actually I haven't had any of the shots. And she stared at me in shock. Haven't had any of the shots. Wow, the, the deal, the house deal is well and truly over. I'm sorry, I cannot have you living here. And uh, it came as a bit of a shock. I could feel the shock in my body. And I said, okay. Uh, and I tried to act pretty normal about it, but it was obvious she had a really strong opinion about, about the uh, vaccine. Uh, um, and then she started saying things as I'm packing up my tools. So, you know, I'm in the shock of just realizing, oh man, I'm meant to move in here in like three days time and suddenly not. 
and um, she started saying things like, oh, I, you know, didn't know there was people like you around, you know, I, for, I forgot there was people that, you know, that, that don't, haven't taken it. Um, and I just kept my mouth shut and just trying to remain um, kind of calm and relaxed. And um, I dropped some stuff off in my boot and I came back for some more tools and um, she walked out on her deck and had her phone in her hand and she said, who's your, who's your coordinator for your job? Because I, I, do, I don't just do gardening work, I do other work as well. She said, who's your coordinator? And I said, it doesn't matter who my coordinator is. She said, yes, yes it does. She said, you're a health risk to the community. She's like, what's their name and number? And I said, I don't need to tell you that. I said, it's up to my clients if they want to hire me or not. And she said, no, it's not. And started you know, looking in her phone. So she was threatening to call up one of my jobs and tell them about my VAC status. And I was, I was shocked. I felt quite threatened. Like I've got a young family and this is, you know, this is, a, this is my jobs. And, um, I still tried just to remain relaxed and I said, well, do you still want me to do gardening work for you? And she said, oh, well, yes, that's, that's fine because you're in the garden and you know, you're not going in the house. And, um, but she hasn't called me since. How um, I came to be in the stage I am now, I, it was when I was um, 12, I started to develop a uh, hot burning knee and uh, very stiff, swollen. And then within months it just spread, just right throughout my body. Uh, it affected not just my me, but it affected my mum became my full-time carer or started needed to spend a lot more time caring for me and it also meant that my siblings weren't given the attention that they needed and it basically became an Ill illness of the whole family um, that was when I was 12 and then when I was uh, my daughter was 12 um, I was required to sign a consent form for the rubella vaccination and a thought came to my head, no, this is how I got um, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And um, so I said no and uh, my daughter was upset with me. My father, who's a doctor, was upset. He said I was being irresponsible. Um, so, but I stuck to that and then when she was 18 she had to do a lot of research um, in for the VCE uh, because there was a vaccination debate going on, should vaccinations be compulsory or not. And in the American Medical Journal she found um, uh, rubella vaccination is known to cause juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. So that was, you know, over 20 years it took for us to have confirmation, um, over 26 years, uh, to find that out, that yes, it was the vaccination. And when I have a full flare-up now, Stuart has to turn me in bed. You know, that's the state that uh, I can get to virtually your whole life you've had this condition um, yeah. which from yours and your daughter's research looks like it was vaccine injury from the rubella injection you had at 12 yeah. not long before you um, the symptoms began is that how does living with that story uh, affect your decision not to get vaccinated with the current COVID vaccines? It took that long for us to find out, but the research wasn't even out. Like that American Medical Journal, it was what 
well over 20 years after it came out saying that this was uh, this is a known thing so I'm so I'm very very reluctant to and I'm very concerned um, for our younger for our children um, because we don't know the long term and so for me I I'm still very hesitant because this is a totally new concept this is not the old vaccines that they had and if the old vaccine has created this I'm concerned about what the new forms that haven't had that the long um, long exposure has is might do for our children. I'm absolutely aware of what was potentially coming down the down the line, but I was blindsided by the government giving me two weeks' notice. Two weeks' notice. No, sorry, two weeks' notice to get vaccinated, right. or I could no longer work as a physiotherapist. And so when I was told I can no longer work, uh, then I realised I'd probably made a mistake and hadn't prepared better in terms of my savings. But also I didn't expect that after 34 years as a physio and considered a valuable member of society, I've, I'm now no longer uh, permitted to work. Mm -hmm. And for me it was an absolute no. The moment I heard of, uh, of the COVID scenario, I knew what, what was coming and I knew it would be a no for me with the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I tried to find some extra work, some part-time work. I used to be a tennis pro or coach, so I was doing some cash work, but not enough to, to pay the bills, and they, they were mounting up pretty quickly. Um, I didn't realise how expensive my lifestyle was until I stopped working. So basically, it was I felt as though it was forced upon me. It wasn't a decision. I wasn't wanting to leave Perth. I thought incredibly rude, disrespectful, amongst other things, of the, of, of the Premier to give two weeks' notice, vaccinated or you're out. And my, the clinics that I worked at were uncompromising. They, they, they feared that they would get a $100,000 fine, and, uh, which nobody has, certainly not in the physio world. Um, that was their belief, that was their position. I had to respect it. Well, I had no choice. <laughs> I can't say I actually respected it. I had no choice. Uh, I was very much alone and felt isolated there because all of my friends in Perth, bar one, had uh, chosen to get vaccinated, so I was very much, I felt like I was getting judged and ostracised and ridiculed and uh, for my choices. Having been single, no, no kids, very much spending day and night by myself, the impending restrictions that were coming uh, within a week or two of me still being in Perth where I was no longer able to go anywhere other than Coles to get my groceries and back home, uh, wasn't a great scenario. Um, you know, to be very isolated like that is not healthy. And then Pete, a great mate from boyhood days, gave me a call, even though he's chosen to be vaccinated. He was sensitive to the fact that uh, I wouldn't be and knew I didn't have money. And he gave me a call and he said, listen, there's a place for, place for you to stay. You, you, know, you can put a tent on my property or get your camper van and you can come and stay with me. And there's a supportive community of other people who've also chosen not to vaccinate. I said, I have, but uh, no problems. You, you're welcome to come and, and stay. And honestly, it brought me to my knees at the time because... There's a lot of stress thinking, you know, I'm 57 and I'm looking at being homeless, you know, which was the reality of the, of the situation that I was facing. Mm -hmm. So I got rid of everything um, and drove over. And uh, now I'm staying at Pete's and we're clearing a space for me to put a tent or actually we just heard today I can get a camper van. And, uh, and that's, my, that's my lot in life at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, which is incredibly generous. So I'll do some swaps for, do some physio for him to fix up his body and fix up his land which you need some help with and uh, I've got sort of some rent free living. Coming here to be immediately embraced by people who are of like mind and, and, uh, and were respectful and sympathetic to my plight and also supportive of the choices that I made. Uh, not judging my financial situation and, and honouring who I am as a person and, and welcoming me to the community as, as you and your partner have and many other people have. So that's the immediate thing. Um, was feeling like, wow, I've, I've, I've found a community, I've found a sense of belonging. So emotionally, in, in some ways, I actually feel happier and, and more buoyant and more hopeful that even if there, th things do worsen in terms of the, the mandates and lockdowns and potential food shortages that are, that are coming and who knows if there's currency collapses and stock market collapses where people are really going to be challenged, I feel as though uh, 
I've, I'm going to be supported, you know, and and I'll be able to support others as well as best I can. So that's nice. It's nice to have a team around instead of being by myself in fear. It's been really hard, actually. I um, I have my granddaughter living with me. Um, she's lived with me since she was 12 months. And of course, when the masks came in, the compulsory masks, you people stopped saying hi in Coles, you know? It was it was almost like there was that great excuse. You didn't have to acknowledge someone because you could say that you didn't recognise them, you know? And the more, I, I th I've really changed. I know that now I, I was someone, I was very adventurous and loved going on road trips and that kind of thing. I became quite fearful about um, going out. And, and at different times, I actually felt agoraphobic. I, I've never experienced it before. It was a personal choice of mine not to be vaccinated. Um, people have asked me why. Um, their instant thing is, oh, you're an anti-vaxxer. And I've said, you know, like, what is that term? I've just had to say, I, I don't feel within myself. And I guess a lot of friends have known, I'm, I do function from an intuitive perspective, I guess, anyway. But um, it didn't, something felt very wrong, very, very wrong. And when I started to feel a shift in the way people started to respond to me in the community, because I wasn't out there about not being vaccinated, but I wasn't backing away from um, if there was a discussion or whatever. You're not able to go into no. the swimming pool. Yep. Do you want to tell that story a little bit? Yeah, Millie's in there now. Um, and I was told at the beginning of the season that um, I was not allowed to go in there. And I said, but this is Millie's and my special place. You know, it's in summer we come here and it's our, you know, I pick up from school and, and we come here and it's our, you know, sort of summer thing. We're not near the beach, so the, the pool is the next thing. And they were just like, you know, you've got to go, you can't stay. Um, and Millie being of the age to be allowed to be in the pool on her own, um, I've, I've said it's okay, you know, for her to go. But um, it, it, it makes me feel very uncomfortable, um, firstly, with her being there. But I don't want, I'm trying to minimise the impact that all of this is having on her. Um, I'm so affected by her school. Like a parent-teacher interview, I'm not allowed to go. She was allowed. She went in, and then, thankfully, I've got a fairly cool teacher. She has a fairly cool teacher who came out and sat down um, on the grass, and we had a, a, a chat, you know, about what was going on. But um, she feels it so much from there. I'm not allowed to walk her into school or anything. Um, and, you know, last year the principal really sort of pointing a finger when I walked in, it was a uh, student's um, a breakfast, big breakfast. And I walked in because Millie was nervous about walking in and the principal came walking up, you know, pointing her finger at me. You're not meant to be here. You can't be here. Um, and all the other students around and the other parents and that kind of thing. And I just said, well, she was nervous, so, you know, uh, and I left. Um, so, comes to the swimming pool and I'm not allowed to go in there. I'm going to let her go. Um, and I'll hang around and make sure she's got some friends there before I'll, I'll go and I'll do some shopping or something. And, and people will say, oh, well, you know, what, it's your fault, you should get vaccinated. Um, and then I've actually had a very good friend of mine and I separate ways because she even went to the extent of saying that I was abusing Amelia because I'm, I'm intending on not getting her immunised and because I'm her carer and I'm not immunised and therefore I'm putting her at a great risk. And um, we'd been friends for many years. Um, so it has, that's, you know, that's kind of how it's personally affected me. Mm. And of course it's made me question, um, am I doing the right thing? Um, 
And there's been times, especially when it comes to around the school, maybe I should, maybe I should do that just so that, because she's already marginalised. She's not with her mum and dad, you know? Um, and that's a subject that really hits hard. So what I want to do as her nanma is try and make her life as normal as possible and, you know, not have her marginalised in any way. Mm. And, um, yeah. you know, and, and, and this has made it that way, but I believe I'm doing the right thing and I have to stand by that. Um, and I believe I'm doing the right thing for her too. All I know in my life, the main thing I know for myself is I have to be integral and I have to honour my, myself, you know, and if I'm not doing that, then everything else is just going to fall away anyway. The push to have the vaccine and there was, um, in the news, there were people talking about the anti-vaxxers, that level of divide was astounding and I turned it off and I haven't looked at it since because it really distressed me. Um, so when that friend said it today to me, um, I was like, well, I can understand that. And I said, I don't know if you know about the demonstrations that occurred after um, and the thousands of people that went that the media never covered or Canberra and what's going on in Canberra. I don't know if you're aware of that. No, she wasn't, you know. And I said, if you're watching mainstream media, you're going to get one viewpoint. <laughs> people being chucked out of their homes, not allowed into the local swimming pools or libraries, lost their jobs, and the left is completely turning a blind eye on this. And it's, that's why we're here today. The same thing is happening to people here. There's, there's stories of vaccine injuries, of, uh, of doctors ignoring um, vaccine injuries, of uh, protecting children from classroom intimidation for not being jabbed, um, stories of uh, split families, divided communities, um, segregation. Many Indigenous and First Peoples are here, uh, and that's that's exciting to see. Um, but it's it's just so tragic that we don't have a greater diversity of Australians here across the political spectrum. The left, where are you? Where the hell are you? You know. Some human rights abuses are okay, and some are not. Hi, I'm Veronica, and I'm the mum of an 18-year-old elite athlete. He uh, received a basketball scholarship to the US, and the only way to get out of Victoria was for him to have double vaccination. He had two Pfizer shots, and on the second one, he, after day three, developed um, chest pain and shortness of breath. And when I took him to the emergency department, they immediately, um, the cardiologist immediately confirmed that he had pericarditis. They referred us to a cardiologist. Our son, after six weeks, was still unable to train, still had shortness of breath. He feeds his body with the best nutrition. He doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke, he doesn't take any drugs whatsoever, including pharmaceuticals. And is now having to take anti-inflammatory medication to avoid his heart becoming, uh, his condition becoming more severe. <laughs> Yeah, so why are you here today? 
We are here today from Bundaberg, almost 100 of us, five busloads of people and 11 cars and campers are here because our government isn't. My auntie died two weeks ago, uh, four days after her third jab. She's dead, died of a stroke. Fit, healthy lady, 60 years of age, took her third jab, thought she was doing the right thing. She's dead. We buried her a week and a half ago. That's why we're all here. <laughs> My name's uh, Tommy Slattery, I'm from Coffs Harbour. Um, I came today just because I had concerns about the way the government's been handling this whole pandemic. It's, uh, yeah, it just doesn't feel right at all to, to, for our freedoms to be taken away and our, our power to choose. So, um, but something that's come really uh, apparent to me is the, the left and right paradigm of political thinking. Um, that this is not really, it's not really uh, applicable anymore because the right used to be authoritarian um, and they used to also support big business but now that seems to have moved into the left because they're the, the most authoritarian throughout this pandemic and they support the pharma, the big pharma and what they want to do to us all and, and the big tech companies as well. They're the ones that are censoring everyone. So I think we have to get out of this paradigm and we have to look at political people that are going to represent our voice, which is we want our freedoms back, we want our democracy back and we want our choices back. So if we can move forward with that and support those political members, I think we can get out of this mess. I, I am supporting you people. We are one, 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 one brother and sister. Yeah. Yeah. So I think going to dance. Anybody want to join you? Yeah. Just me for a full time. I'm sure. Anybody want to join in? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Anybody going to join in? Anybody? Woman or man? Australian people we are today. So we are different language, but we are one people. Yeah. And God's sister. My colour is a bit different, but we are Australian people. Okay? So I'm supporting you people, so we're going to get the power back. Yeah. And, say, and say, government, look here, this is our country. Yeah. Yeah. We are Australian people. Wonga Gujiba, Wonga Gujiba, Manna Mura Wadja. And we all want ya, one and one everybody. And thanks very much for listening, because I support you people. I've been round, round the country 
country there a long time since I was young. And I'm on still here. Okay. Experience because we we saw Australia as we had forgotten it being um, open and joyous and everybody enjoying themselves uh, from all walks of life um, without this without constraint and you don't realise until you till well, I hadn't realised until I came here exactly how much we had changed we'd all become we'd all interiorised, we'd all become very insular. Um, and when I, th when I think back, how am I going to communicate this togetherness um, to friends of mine back in Sydney who have lost any sense of that? Uh, yes, having uh, control, uh, necessary controls over disease, of, that, that's a, that, that must be done. Having a vaccine as an option for, for people who are sick or compromised, absolutely don't have a problem with that. But forcing children to do something like this for the sake of, the, of old people when they don't get affected by it, it's a nonsense. And that really drove me down here. Yeah, uh, my name's Tim, I'm a farmer. Um, uh, we come down from the Capity Valley, which is up near Mount New South Wales. Uh, last weekend I became a grandfather and I have uh, kids uh, of my own um, and this is <clears throat> like the first time in two years I've been off my farm uh, I thought I, I, I knew I had to come down um, just to get to be uh, I don't know be with people that I think that think the same you know? and um, what I was saying yesterday oh, made me feel good and um, yeah, I needed that. You know, I needed that. It's this is split my family, and um, you know, I needed to come down and just show that you know, like I care, I care. I want, I want what I had as kids for my kids, and um, so I thought it was important to come down. And uh, I'm in the RFS. I've been in the RFS for 25 years. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> And they're going to kick us out. And um, I'm a deputy captain. I come down with my captain. And uh, yeah, they're going to kick us out, mate. And, uh, and I think that's that's you know worth standing up for. You know, I don't put my life on the line for 25 years to be thrown out because I won't, you know, you know, take an injection that I'm, I'm I don't think I, I should have to have. So. Yeah, it's pretty it's sort of pretty emotional. Yesterday it was pretty emotional, which was good. You know, it was uplifting, mate. Eh? It, it was good for the soul. It was good for my heart, and just made me feel good. And now to go home and you know, tell as many people as I can that you know that we need to stand up. You know, you, you want this country back, and you want a free Australia. We, we need to stand up. You know, our prime minister changed one and three nothing one and free about this country at the moment and I think there's the most divided I've ever seen Australia and I don't like it and I don't want that for my kids so that's why I'm here <laughs> thank you Tim for ending with so much heart and thank you to Tyson, Nira, Mark and Leslie for so bravely telling your stories from home thanks to Veronica, Steve, Tommy Uncle Murray, George, John and the organisers and volunteers Thank you to all of the protesters that walked in solidarity in Canberra. Nothing changes when we are isolated from each other. 
Thank you to Dean and Alexander for ferrying us up and being part of the local love convoy. And thank you to Miles for your wonderful footage and expertise once again. Wherever you are in the world, we'd like to hear your story and your views relating to this time. So please feel free to leave comments on our website and please share these stories with friends and family who may not have heard alternative perspectives from feeling, thinking, sensing people who are not the monsters that the corporate state and media so readily portrays us to be, but real on the ground folk who don't believe coercion is choice. If you value these stories and you'd like to support our work, please head to artistersfamily.is and click on the support tab. Thank you to all who continue to give so we can make these weekly videos available. Sending love and solidarity to everyone, our jabbed and unjabbed friends, our fans and our enemies. Sending good vibes and sweet times to the lot of you for whatever we face now and in the future.